All right, Second Timothy for beginners. This is lesson number four in that series. Encouragement and instruction, remain faithful, part three in the particular section that we're studying. And if you're using your Bibles, Second Timothy chapter two, beginning in verse 14. Uh, I think it would be helpful to uh, look at our outline once again to see where we are in our study of this epistle. Just to kind of uh, put into context the things that we'll be looking at today. So Paul began with the greetings and thanksgiving, uh, chapter one. And basically this epistle is about encouragement and instructions for this uh, young evangelist. And so Paul's main message, remain faithful in various areas. Remain faithful to your calling you know, as a preacher. Remain faithful to the gospel itself, the message itself. Faithful to the doctrine that uh, Timothy had been taught by Paul and others. Remain faithful in service, in service to the church. And today, remain faithful um, to your ministry. This is the section that we are going to study today, chapter two, verses 14 to 26. So remain faithful to your ministry. The, the work of ministry was difficult, especially in the first century, where churches were few and far between, when Christians had to deal with uh, persecution, and in Timothy's case, at Ephesus, false teachers may have been spreading false doctrine and plotting to undermine his leadership role as an evangelist and teacher. I mean, ministry is hard enough uh, to, to, to do uh, without having someone in the congregation actively working against you to undermine what you are doing. So Paul can't be there, obviously, to help him in person. So his letter is filled with practical instructions as to what Timothy needs to do in order to weather the storm, to maintain unity in the church, to maintain order uh, where he is ministering. You, you can't minister to people if they're divided, if they're fighting among themselves. Very difficult thing to do. So in this section, Paul describes five things that Timothy had to do in order to deal with the issues that he faced. Okay. Um, there's more to the work of ministry than these five things, but Paul is not writing a, a general epistle about ministry. He's counseling one minister about his particular situation. So for Timothy, remaining faithful to his ministry in his situation required certain things. First of all, he says, Timothy needs to teach the troublemakers God's word, that's always the defense. That's always the defense and it's always the offense. Teaching God's word in every situation. In his situation, he had troublemakers. His, his role was not to use their tactics you know, to take care of them. His, his role as a teacher and a preacher was to teach them, to preach. Okay, so we read in Chapter two, verse 14, he says, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. Of course, the them that he's talking about here that he has to remind are the Gnostic teachers who promoted a, a polluted gospel comprom uh, comprised of mixed ideas from Greek philosophy, uh, pagan religions, some from Judaism and from Christianity, and then mixed all these things together to create what they considered a kind of a super gospel, a better gospel. Their teaching and their content and style produced speculation and debate among those who were exposed to the teaching. Debates that had no conclusions since the topic of discussion had no inspired source and no inspired teachers. So the debate just went on and on and on and on. You know, there was no way to, there was no way of saying, thus saith the Lord. There was no way of saying, you know, the, such and such a verse or such and such a prophet. 
Not only were the debates useless in that they didn't edify or provide knowledge or provide insight. I mean, there's nothing wrong with debating, going back and forth and you know, arguing your point. And, uh, nothing wrong with that. But these debates on these topics didn't edify. They didn't, they didn't grow anybody's knowledge. They didn't provide any type of insight. They actually harmed those who participated. So Paul is saying you know, constant speculation and debate over man-made ideas tend to discourage people from searching for the truth. People finally, you know, they, say, oh, we, we, you know, they become agnostics. Ah, all this arguing and debate, all this, ah, forget about it. They, they kind of withdraw altogether. Their disappointment in fruitless religious debate often leads people to lump the gospel message in with the rest of the false teaching. How many people have you met say, oh, you know, do you want to share your faith? Oh, you know, I've been this, or I was a Catholic, or I was a this and that, and there was a fight in the church, and oh, I just threw everything away. It's all no good. Or even they were members of the church, and because of the actions of someone, whether it be a leader in the church or another member, because of their action or their immoral behavior, whatever, they just threw everything out. It's all no good. And this, is, this was the danger here where Timothy was working. People get fed up and just throw it all away. It's a bit like people who have been hurt spiritually in some cult-like religion. They'll no longer trust any religious group, believing that all churches are the same. I, you know, online, I get a lot of people writing to me uh, who have had a bad experience in the church and you can tell their bitterness. Oh, wow, they're really, really bitter. And there's no, there's no soothing them. There's no passage you can give them because they're dealing from emotion. They're not dealing from reason. They're not dealing from reading it. And they're dealing from emotion. And so emotion kind of buries everything else. So Paul wants Timothy to avert this problem by reminding, and how do we remind as ministers? Well, we repeatedly teach and bring to one's attention. So Paul is saying, bring to these people's attentions, these teachers and these debaters, bring them the gospel, remind them of the base doctrine of our faith. He refers to these things, you know, which are the concepts and the teachings that Paul has mentioned up to this point in his letter. At first he says to Timothy, you, know, you, you, need, to, you, know, you need to be grounded in, in what you've been taught from me, Paul, that is, and others. You know. Now he's saying, and the thing that you've learned from us, you, know, you need to be teaching these other people who are causing trouble. Instead of pointless debates that neither edify or educate, continually remind the church and especially these people, the troublemakers, of the gospel and its power to save, along with its promise to exalt the faithful Christians to the right hand of God when Jesus comes. Doing this will replace useless religious speculation with the knowledge of God's will for mankind and the glorious future that awaits those who believe. Remind them, remind them of the gospel and remind them also of the you know, the, the rewards of Christianity. Perhaps what is not said but implied here is that Timothy himself not be drawn into useless debates with these people and focus instead on preaching and teaching the gospel which will be much more beneficial for him as well as the church. And so remaining faithful to his ministry also required Timothy to accurately preach the word. So teach the troublemakers you know, God's word and make sure that he himself was accurately preaching the word. Verse 15, be diligent, he says, to present yourself, approved to God, as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handing, handling excuse me, the word of truth. So Timothy is battling teachers and hearers who are polluting the gospel, and in response, he's, he not only must continue to focus on the gospel, but demonstrate that he's a competent teacher. Being diligent means 
diligent to his study and his preparation as a teacher and preacher. Time and distraction is the enemy of the preacher. The enemy of the preacher. The, uh, the, 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 the minister who is responsible for the pulpit, you know, uh, now we're very blessed in this church because we share it and that's good. That takes the burden off of one person. But the majority of churches of Christ, the, you know, Bud for example, I see Bud back there. I mean, the preacher's got to get a sermon ready for Sunday morning and then he's got to get another one ready for Sunday night. In addition to that, he has to prepare his class for Sunday morning and he has to prepare his class for Wednesday night. That's four pieces of teaching that he has to prepare every single week. Throw in a bulletin article. That's a lot of material. That's brand new material. I often used to think, you know, Chubby Checker, remember Chubby Checker? You know, Let's Twist Again. Chubby Checker wrote Let's Twist Again and sang that song. And that one song, he sung it a million times. He's put his kids through college, you know, <laughs> singing Let's Twist Again, which lasts roughly three minutes. Yeah, three minutes, wow, that's... Preachers, you know, they, they got to prepare a whole lot more than three minutes, week after week after week. So I'm saying time is the enemy. Time is the enemy because you've just got so much time to study and prepare. Other things happen, the phone rings, somebody drops in, somebody is sick, it's important. Sister so-and-so passes away, whoops, let's add a funeral to that. So, so what I'm trying to get across here is it's nothing new. Paul is saying to Timothy way back in the very first century, be diligent, you know, focus, make sure that, you know, that you're handling the word of truth. And all modern preachers read this and they understand exactly what Paul is saying to, to Timothy. When he preaches, it should be obvious to his hearers that he's prepared, he's knowledgeable and thus competent. Timothy must realize that when he preaches to the church, he's also preaching before God as well. It's no small thing to get up and say, thus says the Lord. It's no small responsibility. He might be able to fool the church with shoddy work, but he can't fool God whose word he's teaching. So Paul has already described the results of false teaching by incompetent teachers, you know, the ruin and the loss of faith of the hearers. So if Timothy is well prepared, and accurate in his teaching, he's going to have a different result. His hearers will be edified and they'll grow in their faith and their knowledge. The false teachers will be silenced and shown to be incompetent. And Timothy will not be put to shame or embarrassed because his incompetency is revealed. On the contrary, He'll have confidence before God and the church that he is skilled in accurately preaching God's word and producing the results that should naturally come from this. It's very important. A lot of times, you know, you, some people are wondering, why is this church not growing? Uh, why, why are there so many problems? And why is, it, why is there division? Well, there can be a lot of reasons, but usually one of the reasons is the teaching is not what it should be, let's put it that way. The preaching is not what it should be. Another thing he tells to Timothy about being faithful to his ministry, avoid debating religious nonsense. And there's a lot of that, especially now with the internet. Oh my, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there. He says, but avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them, Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. So Paul has reminded Timothy what his prime responsibility was, preaching, teaching accurately God's word, especially the message of the gospel. Here he adds what Timothy is not to do. Don't waste your time listening to and debating the false teachers. By doing so, he gave them a platform and a measure of credibility and a cause, uh, you know, and, and, and a cause uh, an opportunity to share their ideas. 
Isn't that what we do with the, you know, when we have these, these mass murderers, people who you know, kill innocents and so on and so forth, and they, they arrest this guy and he's got some sort of manifesto. He's got some sort of thing he wants to say and he did this terrible crime you know, to give you know, publicity to his ideas and many times they won't, you know, they won't print or they won't pr produce the guy's manifesto because they don't want to give, they don't want to give it any oxygen. Well, it used to be like that. It's not like that anymore. Now it gets leaked on the internet. And it's all over the place. This is exactly what he's saying here. Don't, don't, don't even give him a chance. Paul tells him that his proper response is to shun them, reject, ignore this business. Paul then focuses his attention on these men um, and he pronounces judgment on what they're doing. Their chatter, he doesn't even you know, dignify what they are saying by calling it teaching, he calls it chatter. It's not spiritual and it comes from below, it comes from the world, not from above, not from heaven. Their talk has already caused some to abandon the faith and return to a worldly lifestyle. Unfortunately, their ideas have spread and this progress Paul compares to the spread of infection, gangrene, through a body, you know, causing illness and death. At this point, Paul actually names two, uh, two men who may have been at the forefront of this movement in the church. Hymenaeus is mentioned uh, in, also in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20 as one troublemaker who was put out of the church. And Philetus, who is mentioned only here. We don't have too many details about him. We don't, he's only mentioned in this place, but this is enough. Boy, I shouldn't want, want my name <laughs> put into the Bible for, forever and ever as a troublemaker. Amenaeus was mentioned in Paul's previous letter and again here, several years later, suggesting that he had caused trouble with his teachings for quite some time. In verse 18, Paul alludes to the false teaching causing the problems that they were having. Apparently, they were teaching that there wasn't any bodily resurrection of the dead. The idea was that Christians had already been resurrected at baptism in a kind of a spiritual resurrection to live a regenerated life with no other resurrection in the future. That was the idea, imagine. The idea was, no, 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 you're not, there's no bodily resurrection and then you're going to go to heaven. No, 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 you've already had your resurrection when you, when you were brought out of the waters of baptism. That was your resurrection. That was your regenerated life. And what you have here, that's all you have. Of course, this idea was contrary to what Jesus and the apostles taught on this subject. Just in case, we, we need a reminder Jesus says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. You only need that passage to counter that false idea. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. He's not talking about baptism here. He's actually talking about flesh and blood. Flesh and blood will be replaced with something new glorified body. So a person can choose not to believe what Jesus and Paul are saying here, but they can't deny what both Jesus and Paul are teaching. What they're teaching is a conscious eternal life after death for believers. That's what we are going towards. The false teachers argued that Paul and Jesus' teachings on this subject were allegorical, only symbolic. Paul charges that they have left the truth and by doing so have wrecked their faith and damaged the faith of others by promoting these ideas. 
For example, if there's no bodily resurrection, well then Jesus didn't resurrect, because His was a bodily resurrection. And if Jesus didn't resurrect, then the proof of His divinity and the effectiveness of His cross and the assurance of His promises are gone because all of these rest on the fact of His resurrection. And how do we know that? Well, Romans chapter one, verse four, talks about Jesus who was declared the Son of God with power, how? By the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Everything rests on His resurrection. His resurrection is the proof that everything else, he said, was true. If that's not true, well then nothing else is. And if you buy into that, then what's the point? Why follow this religion? So people who bought into this false idea soon lost their hope of heaven and eternal life. And they lost their faith in a resurrected Jesus because these were based on a risen Savior, not, an, uh, not a symbol, not an allegory, not a metaphor, an actual bodily resurrection. He was dead and then he was alive. And so in chapter, we go back now, we go back to 2 Timothy verse 19, he says, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So Paul uh, reassures Timothy and anyone else who may read this letter or be taught by Timothy that the foundation, meaning the gospel and the teachings of the church, the foundation of Christ stands firm despite the false teachings that are circulating. So the gospel stands. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel stands. The teachings stand, First Peter. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. It stands. And the church stands. Jesus himself says, I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now in addition to this, Paul also assures Timothy that God knows who the fakes are and who are his faithful servants. And this knowledge is sure, it's sealed. So maybe you're having trouble you know, deciding who are the false teachers, who are the true teachers, you know, but God doesn't have any trouble. He knows who the fakes are and He knows who the, the true ones are. And the true ones are sealed, nothing can, nothing can destroy them. And how, how, how do we know the true ones? Well, the true ones teach and preach God's word accurately. And those who are His live faithful lives striving to be pure in this corrupted world. It's easy to tell who the Christians are. They're not perfect, but they're striving for it. <laughs> they're not perfect, but it bothers them that they're not perfect. In the world, people use that term, well, nobody's perfect. They use that term to kind of justify you know, their laziness or their immorality or their, you know, they use that, well, nobody's perfect. But Christians, they don't use that as, a, as an excuse. That's a, that, when they say nobody's perfect, there's a longing there. It's like nobody's perfect, but I would like to be. I sure want to be perfect. I'm shooting for perfection. That's the difference. It hurts me that I'm not perfect. Without even mentioning them, Paul describes the two factors that will condemn the false teachers at judgment. Their heretical teaching and their wicked behavior, which is a confirmation that they're false teachers. So Paul uses this rebuke of the false teachers to remind Timothy of yet another thing he must do in order to be faithful to his ministry. And that is, 
he must flee immoral behavior. Chapter two, verse 20 and 21, he says, now in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. So Paul is probably referring to the church here, you know, in a large house, and alluding to the fact that there are different types in the church. In context, the differ, the, he differentiates between the false teachers and followers, those are the earthen vessels, the wooden vessels, and Timothy and those who remain faithful to the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, they're the gold and silver vessels. Note that it isn't God who determines the quality of the vessels, but the individuals themselves. By adhering to the proper gospel and teaching and by avoiding immoral lifestyle, they you know, are being gold and silver vessels. It isn't, it isn't stated here, but we read between the lines that the precious metal vessels are used and are kept while the earth and wooden types are used for a while, but they eventually, they're discarded. Based on this spiritual reality, Paul encourages Timothy to be careful for his own soul's safety from the corruption that's in the world and the distractions in the church. So we read verse 22 and 23. He says, now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations knowing that they produce quarrels. So as a man, he's talked, he's talked to Timothy as a preacher, but he's, he's a man, an ordinary man. So he needs to first of all run away from various physical temptations common to all men. You know, just because he's a preacher doesn't mean he, get, you know, he gets like an invisible shield of protection. He, he has to be careful of his behavior, what he consumes from the world. And he says, flee, run away from it at the first thought of it, run, he said. Don't, don't think you're strong. You know, you know you may be in trouble if you're saying to yourself, I can handle this. I can, I can, yeah, I can get close because I can handle this, yeah. You're, you're on your way down when you start saying that to yourself. And preachers, of course, what are they dealing with? Well, they're dealing with people, all kinds of people, but some people who have like big problems. You know, the number one cause for youth ministers um, uh, to uh, stop uh, working in youth ministry is uh, internet pornography. That's the number one cause. Well, it's, why, why would that be? Well, because youth ministers use media in their youth ministry. Why? Because the kids, they're all on you know, Facebook and Twitter and uh, Twitch and whatever else. And so youth ministers are online as well. Well, there's a lot of junk online. And pornography, we, we had a class on this, pornography is, oh, it's insidious, it's, 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 uh, it's terrible, it's addictive. You know, there have been studies that say, that study brain waves uh, that, that tell us that pornography is as addictive, it does to the brain the very same thing that cocaine does to the brain, exactly the same thing. So it's highly addictive. No wonder young and experienced ministers who are trying to, you know, they get caught up in that stuff. You can't say, oh, I can handle this. You know. Paul says, run away, run, flee, he says. And as a Christian, Timothy needs to chase after and focus on right living and faith and love and peace and other Christians who like himself call on God in prayer with a clear conscience for these same things. You know, run away from the evil in the world, run towards righteousness. And as a minister, 
Timothy needs to avoid the kind of debates and arguments with the people Paul has previously mentioned and continue preaching God's word. Stay focused. Stay focused on preaching and teaching the word. And this brings Paul to his final point concerning Timothy's ministry. Seek and save those who have fallen. So teach the troublemakers, accurately preach the word, avoid debating religious nonsense, flee immoral behavior, seek and save those who have fallen. Paul still has an eye on the false teachers and those affected by them as he instructs Timothy in how to engage them should he need to. Verse 24, he says, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So his approach should not be one where he debates and quarrels on their terms, trying to deconstruct their doctrines and opinions. Instead, he's to teach God's word with kindness and patience and gentleness, correcting the errors that they have embraced. His attitude provides them the motivation to listen to the word that is taught. So Timothy's motivation to reach out to them is the knowledge that they're trapped and condemned by their embrace of this false doctrine, uh, or by their embrace of this moral, immoral behavior. You know, sin's like a bear trap. And people get too close and they put their foot in it and the trap closes and they're stuck. Other Christians, sometimes the minister is there to kind of help open up that trap and you know, release them from it. And I think the, the very first thing to understand um, in order to be successful in helping someone else is to realize that the other person is trapped. They're trapped in that thing. And so Paul, unable to be with Timothy in person to help deal with a, a destructive movement in the church, counsels this young preacher to remain faithful to his ministry and he describes five practical ways that he is to do this. And these five practical ways are still practical today. I noticed up there on the table there, we've got uh, uh, Dayton's notes from his sunset days on 1st, 2nd Timothy. Uh, at sunset, they, they, they taught this book uh, in depth because it, it really is uh, instructions for young uh, ministers. Five practical ways to remain faithful in ministry. Teach only God's word. I don't know how many times people have come up to me and said, you know, you got a lot of time, you know everybody in the church, have you ever thought of getting your real estate license or maybe you know, sell this or you know, yeah, no. Or how about you know, uh, products? You know, all you'd have to do is you know, people could buy products and you could just you know, get four or five others to sell products for you. Nothing wrong with that. People you know, earn their living in various ways. Not me, no, I don't have time for that. I don't want to be involved with that. The only thing I want to be known for is preaching the gospel. That's the only thing I want to be known for. Oh yeah, he's a preacher, yeah. What, what else does he do? Nothing. <laughs> he just does that. Teach accurately. Teaching accurately requires study. You got to put the time in. Avoid useless debates, and believe me, there are a lot of useless debates out there. And in this day and age, it's not a useless debate, but Politics, you know, we've become, you know, the, whole, the whole country is debating. It's easy for preachers to get involved in that debate. Flee immoral behavior, well that's, I mentioned young ministers, but you know, <laughs> temptation, <laughs> temptation lurks about for young and old. And seek and save those who have fallen. Remember, you know, Jesus came to seek and save the lost and he sends out those who have committed themselves to ministry to do the very same thing. Uh, when, uh, when I'm talking about uh, Bible talk and I go somewhere to speak on that particular subject, um, 
I, I tell the audience, uh, Bible talk is searching for those who are searching. I was a person who was searching and because of a small ad in a, in a newspaper that the preacher had put in, he used media, he, God found me through that ad. And so I do the same thing. I'm searching for people who are searching, except now in my day, God has provided this marvelous tool called the internet where I can search on a wide, you know, on a wide basis look for people all over the world. And we know we're finding them because they write to us and tell us. And the, the most satisfying thing is they write to us and tell us this and ask us, where can I find a Church of Christ near me? I'm in New Zealand. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Tehran. I'm in, uh, I'm in Turkey. I'm in Greece. I'm, I'm, I'm in Uzbekistan. You know, I mean, the internet goes everywhere. And they say, where can I find a church? And so the, the reference book I go to most often is <laughs> on Google, Churches of Christ in such and such a place. And I'll try to find three or four, or I'll, I'll kind of you know, make sure I, I'll take a look, because you know, uh, there's all, there are different groups that are called Churches of Christ. There's United Church of Christ, which is not us, and you, you know what I'm talking about. So I try to kind of focus it on congregations that I know, that I know are restoration churches, you know, and I send them that in the mail. Do I get follow up, what happened? No, like the Ethiopian eunuch, he went away rejoicing. What church did he go to? I don't know, <laughs> but I, 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 I'm, I'm persuaded that I'll see him in heaven. I'm persuaded I'll see uh, the Ethiopian eunuch in heaven. All right, uh, next week a warning that Paul is going to give to Timothy. All right, that's it for uh, Today we'll continue next week.